right. Welcome back to another episode of Friends From Work, a podcast about all things in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, hosted by me, Robbie Earl, and by him, my longtime friend from work, Kyle Sconewill. And today, we are going to be talking for really only the, the second time in full here about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, the latest Marvel Studios film and one that people seem to be really enjoying. And so I'm looking forward to really enjoying speaking about it with you, Kyle. How about you? Absolutely. I feel like we should start with a quick box office update because it is far exceeding expectations. I'm looking it up real quick. Have you seen some of this? I, I really think it's getting it's getting close to 800 million. Wow. Um, let's see. It's grossed over 665 million. Same. Domestic. <laughs> domestic. Just, did you say person. like, yeah, like you've grossed over 600. I wish, dude. My life would be so much easier if that was the case. Just one less thing, you know. I feel like it'd have to trickle down to me at that point. It'd have to. <laughs> Uh, but I saw that it was on pace for a $800 million thing, which I think someone can fact check me and correct me if I'm wrong, would be better than the first guardians and the second guardians, I think. So oh, wow. I think the, the cool thing has been that the drop off each week has been less than most other MCU movies. So mm -hmm. the, the word of mouth power on this film is strong. The word is getting out that it's pretty good and people are going and watching it. That's, I mean, that's what you want. And you in some ways, it. that reminds me of, I mean, that, that feels kind of classic Guardians. Uh, even in the way you and I talked about kind of expectations around that early film and the difference between what people, you know, people were looking forward to Avengers Age of Ultron in 2014. Um, they weren't really, they were just kind of trying to get past Guardians of the Galaxy. And then it turns out that's the the movie that kind of, really became the sea change. So so did you go see it a second time with Candace last night? Was that her first time? Yes. And yes. And yes. And uh, we had a we had a great time. Uh Candace loved it. We had like she and I had uh which is not always the case, but we were sort of remarkably in step uh with like mm. a lot of things she said coming out. Um there were a few things that she caught or or had reactions to that I hadn't um, that I'll bring up here. But by and large, the stuff that I feel like I loved coming out of it, she loved. And the stuff that I thought was like kind of take it or leave it, I think she was in the same boat. But generally, it was. It, I had the same experience uh, that I talked about in our initial reactions, which is just really fun theater. Like even, even several weeks in, it was an early showing uh, like an early ish in the night, like a 6 p.m. showing. And the crowd was just really into it. It seemed like there were a lot of people still seeing it for the first time and kind of mm. all the gasps and the laughs and like people sticking around for the credits and kind of talking to the screen. Like it felt very much like a classic MCU movie experience. It ended up at 82% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and 94% wow. audience score. Um, that's like, that's very high for an audience score. Very right? high. Well, you know what? And, and I think in this day and age, in this genre, that's high for a critic score as well. Because if you're getting yeah. over 80, people are predisposed to not liking it right now. Um, yeah. So that's that's pretty good. Well, even like I think um, Infinity War is at like 85 or 82 or something. Yeah, like that, so. I think that's right. Well, even uh, even the Batman, which I feel like was generally pretty well received, I think was around 80 something uh, critic score. So there's really two things I want to accomplish today. You tell me the order you want to do it in. I think we should come up with a joint ranking for this so we can update our website, mm -hmm. add some tracks to our journey through the MCU. Uh, and then 
the only difference on my viewing this time versus the first time is that I finally got a chance to take notes in the Ooh, theater because nice. I watched it by myself. So I did get a chance to write down some of the little things that I said I couldn't remember on that first screener that mm -hmm. I knew I loved. So I want to read those at some point, and I think we should sort through it on a ranking. Do you want to do you want to do a 180 here and start with the ranking, try to come up with something, and then go from there? Or do you want me to go through some of these things? I think. Or do you have a different idea? I think we should go through them first, uh, just because I feel like that always informs the the final conversation there. Okay. Well, first of all, by the way, I on. mean, look at this shirt I'm wearing. And Let's you're go. and you're repping the the banana cream color there. I am. You were I a am. skeptic. You were a skeptic. You know what? I like them both. So we have two options. If you want a new Friends from Work Guardian shirt, a banana cream or oatmeal, <laughs> those are the two colors. <laughs> My wife was like, you know, you could just write gray or white and yellow next no. time. I'm like, no, from it now says banana on, cream. From now on, they will. we will only put out shirts in food-based colors. <laughs> if it's not I, a food, it's not a shirt. We send it back, Michael Scott. <laughs> we send if it the back. salad comes on top, I send it back. <laughs> Why would the salad come on top? If it comes on top, I send it back. Um, but I think I have less than 20 left, so just last little pitch if you want to get them. That's 20 uh, over all the different sizes and the different colors. So if you can find your size and color, I will gladly ship it to you this week. Okay, so big picture for me, Robbie, very little has changed. I know that doesn't make for a great podcast, but I still very much enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I watched the second viewing by myself in a theater with very few people. And yeah, even the few people that were there laughed at the same jokes I was laughing at. I found a lot of the same things funny. I mm -hmm. thought picking up a little different tone on some of the characters because now I've seen it a second time and less worried about if people are going to die or whatnot worked just as well. So I'm about in the same boat. Whereas, you know, we've had other viewings where our screener was really bad. And then the second viewing was good or the screener was really good. And the second viewing is bad. This was pretty much like really good, really good for me. Yeah. Uh, I think I was in about the same spot. I think that, uh, yeah, weirdly I had almost the exact same reaction both positive and negative to, to all the same things. Like there were oftentimes more, more often than not, I would say I enjoy a movie more on a second watch, unless it's a movie that really benefits from the, mm. the kind of edge of your seatness, you know, like the suspense. Yeah. Yeah. Like an M night movie or something, which even, you know, even that, if it's done like the sixth sense holds up amazingly well on multiple watches, <laughs> but true. Um, but, Oftentimes it's because I of exactly what you were saying. Like once I can pay attention to some of the threads throughout and how those are how well and and, and deftly um, a director is is weaving those and whether there's kind of anything left dangling or whether everything's connected, like that all almost always takes a second watch for me to mm -hmm. to fully register. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's like what we talked about before, and I, I noticed this again kind of rewatching uh, Guardians and, and Guardians 2 especially, James Gunn is particularly talented at, at taking a lot of ingredients and and making sure that everything is is correctly balanced. Uh, like no, no matter how many things are thrown in. Now, I don't think that means... And I, I, I do want to talk about this in a second. I don't think that means that he's always choosing the right amount of ingredients, if that yes. makes sense. Sure. I, I think that there's still a case to be made that, you know, he could have done with two or three less things and maybe had a, a, a generally kind of tighter film. Uh, hmm. But I do think that when it comes down to it, he's someone that seems to be enough of a of a perfectionist to once he's decided that something's going to be included, he's going to make it work. Um, it, it's never going to, I never really feel, even with all the reports that come out, like when we talked about uh, Thanos in, in Guardians 1 or like Adam Warlock here, I never feel in the, in the moment that those things are forced because I think narratively he does a lot to reinforce that stuff. But 
I can still see an argument for why maybe it would be a cleaner movie if if he if he were less confident in his ability to do that. <laughs> Then I think maybe okay. he. It, does that make sense? Uh, yeah. There might be some. There might be room for a little bit of of improvement. Well, I want to start there then because I have very few critiques in my notes, and and yet this movie is not going to surpass Guardians one for me or crack my top five, mm-hmm. even though I loved it. So I'm actually genuinely curious. What would your critiques be? enlighten me and maybe that's when I'm having a hard time putting words to. So the while we're on the subject of kind of too many things, I should clarify. I don't know that I felt that Adam Warlock was shoehorned in mostly because of of two things. One, as someone that spent so much time with these movies uh, because of how often we we watch and rewatch and talk about them. Mm-hmm. I've thought a lot about the kind of dangling thread of Adam Warlock, uh, the same way that I've thought about the dangling thread of of Mordo after the first Doctor Strange or or mm-hmm. like Vulture after Homecoming. Both of both of those, I think, were not at least yet satisfactorily like looped back to. Um, mm-hmm. So this would be one where had they not dealt with Adam Warlock in this film, given how much Guardians 2 seemed to kind of be an extended introduction of that character, I think mm-hmm. I would have felt like there was something going on where they had a plan and ditched it, which is never what I want to see happen. So that's one thing. And two, Adam Warlock's such a huge character in the comics, uh, at least on the cosmic side, that it's not a character that you would just kind of hand wave away. So mm-hmm. I think once you play with that, you have to do something with it, kind of in the same way that you do with Thanos. I mean, the, Adam Warlock, at, at least at points in Marvel's history, and Thanos were very much like on a tier in terms of kind of significance within the mythology. Hmm. Um, so that, I say that because I felt like it made a lot of sense the way that he did integrate that and how that wound up working. Candace coming not from that perspective felt like a lot of the Adam Warlock stuff uh, was forced in. Like Hmm. she felt like uh, even if, and I kind of pushed back where I said, but, you know, they did, that was kind of one of the big cliffhanger credit scenes, you know, in in volume two. And they did link it back into a lot of stuff in, in volume two in terms of the sovereign and explaining who they were. And, and again, all stuff that I think, was done really well once the decision was made uh, to include him. But I think she almost felt like that all of those added layers, like his relationship with his mother, like some of the things that I liked in terms of making it feel more organic, I think she felt maybe some of the some of the stuff that I found myself thinking for like Wakanda forever, I, I think with some of the characters, particularly like how, like we talked about how I thought Ironheart in that movie definitely had a role to play, but maybe not as large of a role as they wound up Hmm. giving her. And I think that's maybe about where Candace landed with Adam Warlock. I think she was so, she responded so much to the, the core of the movie, like the family of the guardians, the, the, some of the emotional beats with them and with rocket that I almost, I got the sense that she viewed a lot of the Adam Warlock stuff as kind of a distraction. Hmm. I totally see the comparison with Ironheart. I think the only difference for me is just that I buy Will Poulter's performance a little more and I'm a little more intrigued about the character overall, but I don't think she's wrong. Right. Well, I I think the difference for me is we didn't have Ironheart in any way alluded to in Black Panther 1. Yeah, true. You know, um, so that's what... They try to do a a good job of right away giving you the first scene of warlock to tie it in. And then, and then tying in that like, well, if we didn't have warlock rocket never would have been shot in the first place. And then, you know, blah, blah, to which then I would say, I like that, but you could have done that with something else or someone else. You didn't have to be him. Same thing with Ironheart. Like if you didn't have Ironheart, well, you wouldn't have the, 
the uh, vibranium being found by the submarine thing? Well, then I would say, well, you could have just made it a different scientist. It could have been a Wakandan scientist that was looking for it or something. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So I mean, both, it's a very good comparison, I think. The, the difference, but, I, but I liked it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'll, I, I want to come back to Wakanda forever kind of at the end of the episode, too. But I, I think the difference for me is, again, I came out of Wakanda, my first viewing of Wakanda forever. And that was kind of my big takeaway is like some of these pieces don't quite fit. Like there's just something, it's not, there's mm -hmm. nothing bad, but there are some things here that seem stitched in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I never felt that because I, I, like I said, I think that that's just one of James Gunn's gifts as a filmmaker. And so I, I thought that using, I mean, cause you had to have kind of a first assault from the high evolutionaries camp, like you're saying from someone. And I think one thing that I like that Gunn does is he's like, well, if that has to, if that has to be someone then, you know, we've got a good candidate to kind of get things going. And it's to mm -hmm. your point, I've, I really like Will Poulter's performance. And I, I think that I laugh at him as a character <laughs> as much as any other in volume three. And it's mostly his delivery. Like the, yeah. <laughs> who threw this thing? <laughs> Always, it, it's like, that's not even that funny of a line, but it's the way that yeah. he delivers it. Uh, yeah, it's funny. It's, I think he's a, so I, but I, I do, I'm with you. I, I totally see where she's coming from. The other big critique that Candace and I were, were talking, oh, not a big critique, but just really the only other high level thing. Uh, I think Candace felt the exact same way I did about the flashback scenes in general, hmm. uh, which I, again, I'm, I'm not sure if this is something, it, it, I don't get the sense that this is a widely held uh, belief, but I just. I don't think so. The two things, the two things about it that I didn't love in our initial reactions episode, I, I still don't love the pacing of it. Like I, I, it just all, I get what they're doing. I get that it's always rooted in what's going on in Rocket's brain. I don't feel like that's, it's not that that's not made clear. Like I know that's what's going on, but just from a, from a narrative perspective, I will be in the present heading towards a thing. And it doesn't always feel like the thing that's happening in the present naturally connects to the flashback that we're getting. Like sometimes right. in movies, I feel like there's a, there are really clever cues. I still think I would have preferred a kind of Tarantino or uh, like Wes Anderson style, just one block of, of a flashback that was condensed. And that's kind of the other thing that Candace and I talked about. I just coming back to it and, and, you know, being, like I said, on second watch, I feel like things like this normally settle in for me. And it was never, it was never bad, but I just, I, I still feel like it, it went a little too, mushy with the animal friends stuff. Like I, I know that he needed a, a background of kind of friends and family and wanting to reclaim that with guardians. And I appreciate that. I just feel like the, I don't know, like the, it, it, it just doesn't, it feels like it belongs in a different, in a different movie. And I know it's supposed to show a level of innocence on the part of rocket and, and I, I like that, but I feel like I get that way more in the interactions he has with the high evolutionary, you know, when he's asking about music and we like it. And like, I, that's where I feel like, oh man, this is who Rocket used to be. And then, you know, he's become so jaded. And I just, because of that, it makes me think even more, like every time we cut back to those flashbacks, I, I just kind of wish that they were done so we could get back to either the future or scenes with him in the past in the high evolutionary. Uh, and Candace was, was, I, th I think maybe even more in the camp of not liking those, those flashback scenes. Okay. But <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm just being scroogey about it, but I don't feel like that's generally my MO. So I feel, no, you know, um, this is where I make my stand. Yeah. I'm in a weird spot because 
I, I don't want to passionately argue with you because I, I see what you're saying. I don't feel at all like you and Candace feel, though. But like I think I think you're supposed to buy that they are children, and that's why they talk a little bit different. And if it is Disney Channel ish, first of all, I like that a little bit. Maybe it's because I have a child and I watch it all the time. Secondly, like that's like I don't think that's wrong for rocket to have that kind of innocence before that all goes down and have that vibe. Um, no, but I'm not going to fight you on it. No, I no, no. Really and I see it. what you're saying. I think I would just say there's a difference between like a, like a, sure, a DreamWorks I, kids movie. Uh, that's like a B minus and like a Pixar or like classic Disney animated kids movie where it's like, I can watch like kid Simba and kid Nala talk and never feel the way that I feel when I'm watching like the, the walrus bunny conversations when it just, it, it feels like, uh, yeah. it just, it doesn't, I don't know. It, it, it feel, but again, I, I think it was a I, choice. I'm not going to meet know. you on this hill. I'm, I, I get what you're saying. Uh, and, and it's not, it, it does not, it doesn't ruin anything at all. It's just, I say that to say, I don't get enough out of those scenes for how much real estate they wind up taking up in the, mm-hmm. in the movie. He definitely was trying to lean into that emotional impact of that. So if that doesn't work as well for a viewer, the whole thing's not going to work as well, for sure. Any other critiques on this second viewing? Otherwise, I'm going to point out some of the things that I loved on the second viewing. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think in general, from a from a high level, what I what I loved to transition us into that, I, I just think every character did, like we said before, get their own arc like I noticed it even more now I think I felt I the the final scene I know we kind of we talked about that last time uh that worked well for me the first viewing it worked well for me again here even better I think kind of knowing that that was the emotional moment rather you know them them parting ways rather than somebody having to die the send-off with Gamora could not have been more perfect when they're back to back, agreed. Talking is such a beautiful moment. I love on a second viewing that it wasn't a giant embrace. It wasn't even like a handshake. Yeah. It was like a wink and a smile. And then as we're walking away, her taking the step to be like, I bet we were pretty fun, which is like shows a little bit there that she gets uh-huh. it. Uh, and he, you know, he says, like, we were the best or whatever. Um, you, yeah, you have no idea. Yeah, you have no idea. Yeah. And I, I just, do, I, I love the execution. And then she has one smile before she uh-huh. walks away. I, I, I loved chills. the, the tracing the Gamora arc here specifically too. Like you, you get a couple moments where you see her tearing up kind of in the background, but it's not normally the focus. So mm-hmm. you kind of have to look for it, but it just, mm-hmm. I, I feel like for how sometimes in movies like that, where you have a character that starts off as a jerk and then by the end is supposed to be a character that you're fully rooting for, uh, th- that's not a very gradual or believable transition. Mm-hmm. But I feel like uh, here it was. And I also loved watching the recurring themes of like <laughs> her. I, I, didn't, I don't think that I, I mean, I noticed it the first time, but I, I laughed more how like her move consistently was like put a weapon to the closest thing to her head. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, even with yeah, like the like, little Stop. thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He had the little, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Okay. okay let yeah. me go through some of these notes. Let me first tell you about nerd riot dot shop. If you go there, they have guardians merch right now. So between the friends from work shirt I'm wearing and our nerd riot stuff, you're going to have all the guardians merch you need. And they are just now sending me some new spider verse stuff that I'm excited to share uh, in an upcoming episode. So check out oh, nerdriot.shop. Yeah. And in the show notes below is a referral link that says that we sent you, which helps us and helps you because if you use the promo code friends from work, you can save 15% off any purchase there. We'll be right back. Okay, Robbie, so this is really sporadic, okay? Uh, 
but just some of the little things that I didn't get a chance to write down on our screener that just still, even by myself, made me laugh. And when I watched it with Annika, she also agreed with these notes, which was really fun. By the way, Annika really liked it, really liked it. And it makes sense to me that just knowing both people, Annika would buy into the flashbacks more than Candace would. That makes total sense to me. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm just going to go through these. These are random. <laughs> the first, like really early on, why don't you just touch him and make him feel better? And then that whole <laughs> sequence yeah. where they're like, no, <laughs> not like that. I okay, so we're back to that kind of touching. I guess we'll draw straws. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Touch him and make him feel better. Uh, I thought the introduction to Adam was dope. The song that they play there mm -hmm. was really cool. And then just immediately establishing how legit this guy is, but then also getting to showcase all of the Guardian's power with Nebula at the new arm and the flying, like, Tony Stark-inspired stuff. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, this is headcanon, but I love that. Like, I love that maybe Rocket and Nebula grew a little bit of an appreciation for Tony Stark and started copying some of the tech mm -hmm. in a way, in their own way. That's headcanon, but I love that. Because, no, you know, I, they spent time. They spent time there. Um, this is from the trailer, so it's old news, but it still makes me laugh. The, okay, we'll kill one stupid guy that no one loves. <laughs> right. You know, when he's like, we're going to kill everyone. <laughs> no, we're not killing anyone. And again, that just plays into the, the, the change I like in Peter Quill. I like that kind of Peter Quill. Like, no, we're not killing anyone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Feels very Han Solo-esque. Uh, I am such a huge sucker for synth bass and John Murphy kills it in the synth bass department and whoever mixed this film really exaggerated at certain times. So like there mm -hmm. are scenes, like if you remember when they're reaching in to grab rocket in the flashback, there's yeah. like an incredibly loud synth bass, like louder than anything else in the movie until he's just about to grab him. And I thought that was used, uh, with a perfect effect. So I liked how dark John Murphy made some of the, the tracks with the synth bass. And then I liked the mix of it too which is a really weird um, comment. He does the suspenseful stuff and the epic stuff really well here. I uh, I wanted to say af after the first, you know, we did our initial reactions maybe with as less lead time or as least lead time as we've had right? Yeah. Uh, in a while. And so I, I think we finished recording. I got on a plane and downloaded the, the film score for this to listen to it. And I've, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. So I, you know, I, I, I know that I've kind of seen things both ways. Uh, I, it seems like some people were disappointed that the, the themes that Bates wrote weren't used more. I didn't feel that way. I, I felt like they were used appropriately. I felt that way only on a second watch. So he uses the big bum, 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 ba -da -dum, to great effect. The first time that Rocket comes back alive, the crazy creatures are cracking into his ship, and then he spins his ship against the big ship to get mm -hmm. them all off his ship. Right. That's the only time they use it. And I think it's a great effect because it's, it's Rocket, he's back. But two things there. I think I wish he had found two or three more spots mm. just to do that, that melody. Like, I don't think it would have been inappropriate. Um, maybe even at the very, no, it's too, too reflective. I was gonna say at the very end when they're running out with all the animals, you could have done it, but no, there's like another moment he could have found. So that's one complaint that I agree with. And then the second complaint is just, if you're only going to put the theme in one time, is that spot with rocket actually kind of a little strange to choose? As the one time for the whole Guardians of the Galaxy theme. Yeah. So, so that's really the only time that they use the, the big so. like black tears theme. He uses the chill stuff. Um, yeah. More, like the to the to, stars. To great type. effect. To great effect. Yeah. I noticed that. And I think that's maybe part of why I was. Yeah. Because I guess it's just the it's it's the arrangement and, and the. How big it is. But I get that. I also feel like this movie uses like. Maybe, I mean, Guardians 1 is similar when I've rewatched it, but I think this is maybe even more. Like, there are a ton of needle drops in this one in particular, mm -hmm. where, like, even more than Bates, like, we talked about that. I feel like Murphy often is just getting getting us from one pop song to another, you know? Uh, right. So, 
I, I think a lot of the moments that I would think of where they would have used that theme, Gunn probably had a, like, you know, like the Beastie Boys track for the, the kind of big final fight with, the, with all showcasing all the Guardians. An important redemption note for me here. I wrote down that Drax is stealing the show. I wrote down one of the lines he had with, can't you see these authentic mechanic uniforms that we are wearing on our bodies <laughs> when he's trying <laughs> to blend in? And I, I know this might be a hot take. This might turn into a goat conversation from Love and Thunder or something like that. But for whatever reason, almost all of Drax's running bits in volume two don't work. Mm. I always remember like my mind right away goes to the turd jokes. I have famously huge turds and I just don't think it's as funny. And I feel like for whatever reason, maybe I can't even find a mathematical answer on the writing being different. Maybe I can't find that answer, but for whatever reason, Drax in volume two is one of my least favorite parts. And it's because his lines don't make me laugh. They don't work. It plays it off as too dumb. I think it could not be more opposite in volume three. I maybe miss a little bit of some of the volume one seriousness, like the way he's introduced mm -hmm. in the beginning and the way he responds about his wife and daughter in the famous speech scene. But almost every one of his lines in this movie makes me personally laugh. I yeah. feel like he got a redemption in that it was funny while being a little less stupid. And I, I, what I think you know, we talked a lot about that, like the how is James Gunn going to handle Drax given the all of the conversations around as he as he become too much comic relief. Mm -hmm. And I think using using the the dadism there to like yeah. link that back to volume one, because now yep. it's like like the, the scene he has with the little girls where he's which, rooting that in his own daughter and what she used to like. Which is perfect, right? Because it, it is getting the dad moment. He's still being dumb, right? Like he's still right. not getting that he's not a monkey. <laughs> he's being a robot. Right. But it's so endearing to the kids that it changes Nebula's mind on him. Mm -hmm. I think that's all like executed perfectly. It's still Drax, but with a redemption arc. Well, and, and even the... Like the the scene that I like a lot where Mantis is telling Drax what to tell Peter and then Peter's like, I didn't know you were capable of that kind of thought. I like that even that is less a because you're so stupid and more kind of going back to the volume one, like his people don't get metaphor. Yeah, yeah, Like yeah, everything's yeah. literal. So it's like there were little kind of connective tissue things there that made it not just – I mean there were definitely a lot of, oh, Drax is an idiot moments, but yeah. there were also – kind of carving out it's not that's not just what's going on here and also mantis sticking up for drax is a sweet thing mm -hmm. their relationship i'm into um oh that's the, one of the scenes by the way they're like their farewell that gets me more than anything yeah yeah i think so too probably also because a little bit of work was done in the holiday special a little mm -hmm. bit um the villain i think i said this on one of our episodes the last few weeks i thought on my first screening that the villain was good, but not some crazy standout. But the more I've just embraced that I hate this guy, the more I'm liking him as a villain. Like the more he's rising up my rankings as a villain because, and again, we've talked about this over on Screensaver Plus as well, but I, I, I kind of like that we're now getting back to an era where you can just be a Shawshank Redemption warden villain mm -hmm. that is just straight... I hate you and I need you to stop doing what you're doing and there's no redemption to him and mm -hmm. that's okay. And that's again, weird for me to say because we've been the other camp a lot of times where it's like, well, we love the killmongers and the vultures of the world where you're like, you know, they're just trying to protect their family or like, I see with the race stuff, what he's trying to do, which is also true. But right. I sometimes think it's okay to just have a guy that I don't feel for. And as far as that goes, this has got to be the most punchable villain in the MCU. It's got to be. Which makes that final, which I had forgotten about, like the kind of ping-ponging where all of the Guardians are coming in just beating the crap out of him yeah, at the yeah, end. Yeah. So satisfying. It's so satisfying. I 
I, t- I totally agree. I think that Candace and I were talking about that. I think he's such a strong villain, both the way the character's written and the performance. One thing that cracks me up on a, on a second watch is he's, wa- so he's, he's trying to perfect this society, right? And so the reason he's obsessed with Rocket is getting the brain and figuring out how to create mm-hmm. like that inventive quality. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking at the, the end results, both on counter earth and what he's yeah. developing for this new colony. He's it, way off. Well, it also cracks me up. Like why are his experiments so often just putting metal limbs on things? What is that <laughs> teaching him about his quest for, for a perfect society? Just putting metal arms on an otter. Where, where does that get him experimentally? I, I love it. You're totally right. I'm laughing with you. <laughs> if I had to push back, I would say, you know, I think he's just trying to take uh, animals that are non-intelligent, that are dumb, give them a brain, and then enhance what they don't have. Like, I'm going to give you, like, a walrus can't move very fast on land, so I'm going to give him a bunch of bunch of legs. Or, right. But, but yeah, it sure looks like he's so far off <laughs> from what his vision <laughs> should be of what a perfect society would be um i I still like the visuals and i like i like the like giant freaky chicken and pig robot monsters so i i'm okay with it but i think that is one area this is such a dumb detail that i'm just a little bit lukewarm on like if Mm. this movie doesn't crack my top 10 part of the reason and this is such a small reason i love the ingenuity of the pig robot and all that stuff but i think it gets a little, again, just emphasis on a little. I don't want to be a hater. A little over the top ridiculous for me. Like it feels a little too James Gunny. Like when uh-huh. the whole army is all of those things, it's all creatures that can fly in space. Right. I'm a little bit like, I think if it was just his guards, I would get it a little more. But when he has like a hundred thousand of them ready to go, I, I don't know. I don't dislike it. It just gets a little bit not my genre, just barely. Well, I think what's, What's interesting to me about it is like, you know, that opening scene where he's he's talking to Aisha about about Adam and what's wrong with him. And I'm like, I don't know, man, like this guy's really strong. It seems Why pretty wouldn't you good just compared make to the pig a guy. lot of these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Compared to the pig guy, he's doing pretty well. Yeah. Like have an army of these and then you would be unstoppable instead of like criticizing her and making more pig guys. Yeah, even the Sovereign's tech seems pretty far advanced compared to the pig man. Right. And he's mad that he built the Sovereign that way. Right. Feels like, feels like you were closer there to right. an elitist, you know, community uh, for sure. Um, I do absolutely love, and I said this in the initial reactions episode, I do absolutely love that the art, music, and literature are some of the finest in the universe on Earth mm-hmm. and that he has an appreciation for trying to duplicate that. I love that because every superhero movie ever tells us that earth is outmatched technology wise. As soon as an, an alien race shows up technology, you know, earth can never compete. It never happens. Uh, but I like that if that's the context, you know, even in captain Marvel, because I'm putting together a secret invasion, friendly reminder, even captain Marvel, you know, they kind of take a crap on Terra and it's a backwater planet. And you know, it's like earth. Yeah. Earth is always, always crappy. And uh, I like that if we can't keep up in the tech department, that at least Earth has an unreplicable art literature culture, you know? I well, and, cool. and that's also been a thread throughout the Guardians trilogy, which I like. Like, you have Rocket getting more and more into Quill's music. You have yeah, the good point. scene with Ego where he's like, oh, you know, one of Earth's greatest musical compositions. Yeah, compositions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. That's a great point. Um, I wrote down as close as I could in the moment, the actual line that both you and I loved so much. And I still, I think it hit even harder the second time. I don't need another speech from some impotent Mm -hmm. whack job whose mother didn't love him enough. And then he gets hung out, you know, or something. And I'm like, yes, that's the quill, man. That's quill right there. It's also, uh, that Groot gun scene is so sick. It's so sick. Dude, that's an all timer as well. Yeah. I love, I love it. And I love the 
the dialogue too is so good there. It's just it like because the whole time it's the same thing that we talked about with that scene where he like he tricks the employee at uh yes. the what is it o- Ogle Corp is that yes to uh, hack into the computer or whatever right uh, where it's like you think and and again that's where I just I think that that's really smart because I think that that is gun understanding that. Quill has been in some of the more recent iterations on like in- incapable, like not full, not, not that he's incompetent, but he's not necessarily yes. the guy that comes in and, Good and point. has the plan anymore. And I like that consistently j- both because I've pointed out wanting more of that, but also just the the kind of, you can see a world where he is just going in with kind of a false confidence and the high evolutionary does just totally like kick his tail. And I like that you never really know how that's going to go until the very end. And then it's just like even more of a win from Peter and Groot than I remembered the first time. Like they just destroy them. And yeah. It's so satisfying. Yes. It's awesome. How much, as we said earlier, Gamora shoots things. And Peter's reaction to that is really funny. <laughs> Definitely a highlight. Uh-huh. Um, even when they're first trying to get the file from that weird archive, and she immediately pulls a gun. He's like, what? Stop <laughs> doing that. <laughs> um, it looks so great. Yeah, it it, does. I, I literally wrote, it looks so great, man. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I see the times, I guess, where, like, you could point out maybe three times that it looks soundstage-y. I again think like when they're flying down in those suits to land on the fleshy planet. Sorry, there's a lawnmower going out here, but um wow, it's really loud. I guess we did need our lawn mode. Um I can't I, hear it. There are there are a few times where it looks maybe a little bit off, but overall, holy cow. One I was right on that, I think. One of the better looking films in the MCU. Just all aspects. Colors, design. Mm-hmm. CGI and effects, set pieces of where they're going to fight, mm-hmm. uh, ideas when to bring in things like the abolisk or ab- abolisks. Yeah, again? I think that's right. Yeah. Like how to bring them in. My wife, because you know she loves monster movies, could not get over how much she loved Mantis riding on those things. Mm-hmm. Like that was like her favorite thing. Does she like um, Kaiju Groot? Full Kaiju. Exactly. <laughs> that's the kind of thing she's into. So yeah. like Mantis taming the abolisks. That's totally her scene. And I thought it was sick too. The Yondu shout out was incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, we never brought that up, but I like just getting one flash. He hardly talks. It's a great homage, but it also fits the character and it helps Craglin. And that makes sense to me. It was executed well. Had to highlight that. Three more left, okay? Mm-hmm. I said this multiple times already. An absolute all timer in the hallway fight. That is. Yeah. An all-timer. I have chills right now. I'm always going to remember certain fight sequences, like the end of Portals. Even that, though, is shorter. Like, just the first charge of Portals, the Titan battle in Infinity War. I'm always going to remember the Shadow Realm battle in Love and Thunder against Gore, and I'm always going to remember the hallway fight in Guardians Volume Mm 3. Two other things. I absolutely love that Rocket discovered he was a raccoon on Earth. And I love that Tanner, shout out Tanner, predicted that in our Burning Questions episode. Yeah, right. Unbelievable. And I don't think that that part could have been better for me. And then lastly, we clarified this on social media. You were right now in hindsight about the interpretation of that final I love you guys from Groot scene. Mm. I can't believe you got that. I, I like the first time I saw it, I was so like, Oh no, I don't know that Groot should all of a sudden now be able to talk like speak English. And you in our first episode said, well, I think he's just, it's now that we're in on the conversation and we are now so a part of the guardians that we can now start speaking Groot to which a few people on our social media said, well, why did Thor have to take Groot as an elective then? Like, why take classes? I did think about well, that. Well, okay, but but hear me out on this. You know, like in any language, there's there are levels to it. Like, if you don't know any Spanish, but you spend 
a month in Mexico, you'll eventually pick up a couple of key things without taking any classes. Like you would pick up like what I love you is and you'd pick up what the bathroom is and that I'm hungry just, just from being around it. So mm -hmm. that's my interpretation. Like you still have to learn all the ins and outs of it, but we've now heard enough Groot that we can pick up on something as simple as I love you. Well, and, I, and to the extent that the idea is, you know, Groot kind of decides when you are like, to the extent it's, it's relational, right? Like the, the moment when Gamora understands, I, I'm my part of my head canon is, is that just something that Thor knows and that he kind of knows how to interact like part of him, like taking that like elective, which obviously is mostly just a throwaway joke, but right. is learning how to relate with Groot. It's a throwaway joke, but it's our job on this podcast to make a headcanon. We, I mean, what and are we doing otherwise? I can always do that. Yes, I, thank I you. always can. And it's involuntary at this point. So those are my final notes. I have two more things before we wrap up here. One, the MCU-ness of it. Where do you think we go from here now? Not talking about the movie as a critic, just where are these characters going? Are we going to check in on the cosmic side again, like with the Marvels? Will there ever be a hint at the Guardians again? You know, will, will people on Earth talk about Peter Quill, which now he's on Earth? Do people on Earth know Star-Lord? Do we think that Mantis or Nebula might ever make an appearance in something else? What do you think about the MCU-ness of it? I mean, I... I don't think when you say people on earth, I mean, I, I guess there are certain Avengers, although really, I mean, in terms of the Avengers that knew star Lord, I guess, well, it would have been Tony, Dr. Strange and Spider-Man, which even Spider-Man that's fascinating, right? right Cause right. does that spell expand to all of the galaxy in which case Quill should not know who that is. Right. Although, you know, that I thought about that, I guess he probably wouldn't really have any context anyway. You know, like, I don't know that he would. Yeah, he just got his name one time, but that wouldn't mean anything to him. But I do. Yeah, I mean, and then I could see Doctor Strange interacting with him again and that being a, a fun one. Uh, and, you know, there is that fun little like footloose moment that they have. And I could see that coming back. I mean, that's kind of a classic. Uh, that's a well that I could see the MCU returning to. But beyond that, you know, I don't think that there would be anybody, you know, uh, Nebula's not on Earth anymore. Uh, maybe Rhodey at some point. But I kind of like that he's coming in somewhat anonymous. Uh, I mean, I really loved even more this time both the scene of him walking back into his grandfather's house and the actual, uh, like the end credit scene I thought was even funnier this time. Uh, I, I, I have no idea on, on the quill side, just because I don't think that I've ever been, I've never known that character to not be primarily space-based. Like even when he spent a decent amount of time on earth, I feel like normally it's from a perspective of of like being a not like an official ambassador, but being like the kind of space expert, you know, and so maybe it's something like that. But I don't feel like that's where they're heading. Uh, I'm yeah. really like but I, that's a great opportunity not to get like on, on a quill tangent, but just to say again how much I enjoyed Chris Pratt's performance in this uh, in a way that. Like, I feel like so much yes. of the Pratt stuff oh, I've gotten. Oh, it's so good. It's, it's great. Like, and, and this is not, I don't, I'm not taking a hard stance against Chris Pratt or anything, but I just, other than the Guardians films, which we, you know, it's just been a while since we got like a straight up Guardians film. Uh, I, I just have not really been drawn to a lot of his other performances, especially in like the action context. Like, I still love Andy and Parks and Rec. But there's something about the way that th this character specifically plays to his strengths that whenever it comes around to the legendary Star Lord will return, I am. Oh, yeah. Real. So like, cool. I'm, I'm genuinely excited about that. Like, I want to see more of where they they take this character. On the on the point of Quill, there were two things that I kind of saw both in, in our community and just uh, some, uh, apparently things that were floating around online. 
Um, one, within our community, I know there was this conversation about whether the quill going back home was too forecasted because of the of the photos that we saw, like how often his grandfather was brought up and stuff like that. I didn't feel that way. I think because one, I I do think that you have to remember most people have maybe only ever seen the first guardians once, you know, or like that are yeah. coming in to see volume three. So I do think we need the reminder. And two, I thought that by doing it so many times, it almost has the opposite effect of like when I'm watching a movie, sometimes if there's just one kind of one mention of a thing early on, I know that we're going to circle back to it because why else would we do that? Like, it's like you, you ultimately know, like in a, in the love and death series that's been on HBO, which I've been loving, there was a, a line in like the very first episode where they talk about a guy being a lawyer. And I was like, well, he's definitely going to wind up coming in as a lawyer at some point in the show. And like, then he does. But the fact that they did it so Spoiler many times, Jeez. Well, <laughs> makes me, <laughs> made me think, okay, is this actually now getting into like red herring territory where like, we're thinking that that's where it's heading. And then, it all kind of makes me buy even more that Peter could be dying in that moment when we think he's dying. I, I, I don't have any thoughts there. I never felt that. Yeah, I never felt I did, that I didn't either. I just wanted to, that was a conversation going on in the days after the, the release. The other thing that I have seen more online, and I think going to address this, is the lack of the Star-Lord mask. Have you seen mm. some of this? Just that he's hardly wearing it. Hmm, let me I don't think, think he ever that. wears it. Oh, any fight, he's not wearing it? I don't think he ever, I don't think okay, he okay. has the, yeah. Well, I think that right there, first of all, shows the importance of it, which is very little to me because yeah. I didn't even remember him not having it on. So it did not bother me, obviously, at all, because I'm about to rank this very highly, and I never right. thought that. But now that I know that information, which I almost wish I didn't, yeah, I could see somebody wanting Gun to find a couple spots to have it on him. Well, and you know? I, I think especially because of how much that final scene is like, oh, Peter's in space and his, you know, it's like that. We've seen uh, him be able to navigate space using the the mat or the helmet. Uh, apparently, and this is where me being not as online uh, is maybe a detriment here, but I think that James Gunn that that was intentional. Like, I, I think that he wanted to, like, I, th what I read was that maybe his initial plan was to have Peter never use that helmet again after volume two. Cause I think there's like the scene where we see it like crumble. Uh, and I, then in infinity war and Endgame, obviously it's brought back and we see it used quite a bit. I really like that we see it used there because it always looks really cool, I think, whenever he's using that in the jet boots. But uh, hmm. apparently, so there was some, you know, again, there's always these conversations that get kind of old to me of like, you know, if, if Gunn had had his way versus like Marvel forced this. And no, I just, no, no, hold on. I'm so tired of that conversation already, well, so I, I'm not going to go there. And I don't really buy a lot of it because, because Gunn was a, a consultant that I think had a, a lot of say when it came to the way the Guardians showed up there anyway. But I think that that's been part of the conversation. I, my own kind of headcanon here is that, uh, you know, they're in a, Peter's obviously not in a very clear headed space anyway. I mean, he's like passed out drunk when we first see him. And then he goes straight from that into this kind of mad dash to try to save Rocket's life. So I think my own headcanon there is just that even if he does still have one, I mean, maybe he just doesn't have the, the boots and helmet anymore because that's just not a, that's not something that he's using. I mean, it's been several years and he's in a different position now than he was. Right. And even if he is, I would buy that in kind of the rush to get out. Just because you said this already, I have to just add, I think that after two viewings, the Peter drunk at the beginning thing is one of my, bigger critiques of the film. Mm. Like I, I, I just don't know that plane was landed enough. They, they tried to make it so extreme at the beginning that he's like blackout drunk, literally, and trying to fight rocket. And then 
if we had come back to that, like we saw that he was drinking again when it was going poorly or the only time they try to come back to it is that he has that tiny line under his breath where he's like, man, if I wasn't, if I wasn't drinking, this wouldn't happen to Rocket, which I appreciate. Yeah. But I feel like that was just almost like two extremes. Like I would say to James, like either make it that Peter is this depressed, although the last time we saw him in the holiday special, we didn't get hints of this. He seemed like he was sad, but he was okay to live with where he was at. So I, I don't think I would have done this the first place. But if you're going to make him that he's so sad that he's like drinking the whole place dry and trying to forget all of his problems, then I think you should probably have at least two to three more hints throughout the film that he's still struggling with this or that this attack on Rocket made it so clear that he has to stop drinking because it's a problem. Like, you need to come back to it then. Like, wow, that event really changed his life because he was in a horrible spot. But to have the whole sequence be... You know, them like carrying him out with a song, Creep, and it's kind of, it's a moving part. But then to act like he's just over it and never follow up on it. So then I think I just would have not done that. Like, I would have made it that he was distracted or searching for Gamora, and that's why he wasn't able to help Rocket, or he had a, he had a couple drinks, but he's not like passing out. There are other ways you could have gone about it that he's really sad and struggling, but not such a drastic event that his life needs to be flip-flopped, if that makes sense. Mm. See, yeah, I, and I think I'm okay with it because I don't take that to be, and I, I like this, that it, it doesn't become a a discussion of of Peter having like a drinking problem or some kind of substance abuse thing. I think it's more just showing that he's kind of lost a, a will to live on some level. Like he's drink, he's drinking himself into oblivion because he's so depressed. Like, and I get the sense that now that they're kind of situated at nowhere and he thinks that everyone else can kind of handle things that he now has given himself permission to just kind of oh. be a, be obliterated because he doesn't care anymore. But if you're going to go that route, do you agree with me that you would have appreciated a couple of more follow-ups then, yeah, I, but I get. I, see, I thought that 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 that's kind of where those mantis conversations were coming from. Like when she's talking about you know jumping okay. from woman to woman, because I, that's I, I almost feel like had I do see. We what haven't you're saying, seen him. We haven't seen but, him jumping from woman to woman. Well, and, but, but yes. that's my point. That's my point. Yeah, I, I think that had we not seen like seen how hard that was hitting him, like how much he is just totally wrecked, then I think that would hit me as more hollow because we haven't seen him in that role since really early guardians one and just stories he's told. Um, and little bits of volume two, you know, him flirting with Aisha and stuff, but yeah, which is one of my favorite parts of that. Yeah. <laughs> but so I, she's like, Aisha's kind of into it. And then right. Gamora looks at me. He's like, no, I find that repulsive, not this casual, you know, Oh, right. please. <laughs> No, I mean, I, so I, but I do, I, I see what you're saying. Cause they don't, but I think that plus him feeling personal, personally responsible and it's showing that like, I, it makes me feel like a lot of the, the mission is him trying to kind of get some personal redemption, uh, knowing that he kind of shit the bed. Yeah. I loved basically almost everything with Peter and Gamora. I thought it was executed so perfectly. I thought both performances were outstanding. Probably my favorite part of the whole film. Um, in, in closing of the, the conversation on the MCU-ness of the other characters, I'm mm. not going to predict a bunch of stuff right now, but I would not be surprised if we didn't see Drax, Mantis, Nebula again, at least for a long time. And when we do see them, it might be more of a cameo role. Like we get to secret wars and we need you know a shot of them or whatever and we will right. i do think we'll get star lord hence the he will return interacting with people on it like a, a main plot level which i'm excited to see now and i think we'll film. get the guardians team to the some extent one. that feels i mean again because i think adam warlock is not done as yeah, a character. adam warlock is not done hundred percent. Okay. So your favorite part, we got to close this episode with placing it in our friends from work <laughs> rankings. We do this jointly. Now I, for myself, which I like to update this currently have preference wise, just straight preference 10th in the MCU mm -hmm. and 
Critically, I have it ninth. I feel like in this particular case, I feel pretty aligned with the critics. I feel like what I'm wanting is what I'm getting and what they're seeing is what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. So that's the context. For people that don't know at home, the current Friends From Work official MCU ranking stands as follows. One, Avengers Endgame. Two, Avengers Infinity War. Three, Spider-Man No Way Home. Pause right there. This movie does not push those three, correct? Uh, correct. Four, Guardians of the Galaxy 1. Five, Thor Ragnarok. Six, Captain America Civil War. Seven, Homecoming. Let me pause there. Civil War, Ragnarok, Guardians 1. To me, this movie does not push those three. I think that's right. Then this is where I think the movie lives. Homecoming at seven, Winter Soldier at eight, Black Panther at nine, Iron Man 10, Avengers 11. What, what do you think? I think it kind of lives in that range to me. You don't like to rank it, but where would you have placed it? I, I think already told you I'm at 10 and nine ish. I think that's, yeah, I think that's probably about right. Um, you know, I think the reason I don't like to rank is because I, it's just so hard for me to to compare. Like it, it, it's always hard for me to put things above the Avengers, uh, right? E even <laughs> recognizing that's so like that is far from a perfect movie, but there are also things there that I just will never get anywhere else. Right. Um, but I do think that this is probably, you know. It's kind of, probably a better made movie. I think that's probably Avengers. right. Um, now, again, you know, you have to look into the, the blueprints that exist, but uh, because of Avengers, but. But the slight critiques you have, you don't have an Iron Man or Black Panther. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Like maybe 11? Yeah, I think that's I think that's probably about right. Remind me, where did we put. uh Black Panther Wakanda Forever. 12. Okay. Then yeah, I think I think about eleven then. Because I feel I, I found myself thinking about I, that. I movie. think I think ten. I think it's better than the Avengers at eleven. Oh no, sorry, sorry, sorry. The, with that would be eleven and Avengers would go to twelve. My bad. So eleven. Because I because I think yeah, like I, I thought, I think this is a better movie as a whole than Wakanda Forever, but I kept thinking about that a lot and that I think both of those movies hit on something. Like I still think Wakanda Forever, it's like really impossible to under or overstate, sorry, how well it handled a really tricky situation um, and, and how much that hits for me every time, the way they deal with T'Challa but also how there are some things that feel just a, a little messy. Uh, I think I get a lot of that emotional satisfaction here in a different way um, mm -hmm. and obviously a much lighter way, but meaningful, but also maybe a little bit. Uh, I can see some things here that I would, I would maybe remove if given the option. By the way, I forgot to bring this up. The one thing that my wife and I laughed so hard at is when they're freeing everyone from the prison and then that super like ugly creature oh, goes, yeah. oh, yeah. and she goes, ah, and then he's like, oh, thank you. And then she's like, I was not screaming at you. It's something else behind you. Sorry. Like, have a good day. Yeah. That's just a funny joke. No, I, I think, uh. <laughs> uh, sorry to bring it back to that um, I, I, I do think okay so the official friends from work ranking of this film right now mm -hmm. is number number 11 on the friends from work ranking yeah which is pretty um, high for a post in game movie all things considered I know we say we're always excited for the next thing so I know that can probably be tiring but I've been rewatching through the MCU so slowly as I've brought up so many times in this podcast mm -hmm. and I just finished Miss Marvel I only have She-Hulk and Multiverse of Madness to go, and then I'll update my rankings officially. But, Robbie, I am developing such crazy takes with some of these that I just really want to get out. So we need to get to some rewatch episodes. And just as, like, a hint, I don't know that a movie has ever fallen further on a first watch, a second watch, than Wakanda Forever for me. 
Wow. The first watch, I thought it was really good. Annika and I had a hard time getting through it last time, which is so crazy. That's so, uh, yeah, that's funny because I think you and I are having a lot of inverse experiences on our second, on our, our watches here. So, so that's why we need to get into that stuff. So that that's coming. I also say, we, we, I think this is finally us closing the the chapter, the book on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 for now. I don't think we're going to be yeah. coming back to these characters for a while. And coming in under three weeks, and for you and I, probably two weeks, uh, Secret Invasion, which is a total shift of gears. Yep. Other than the scrolls, a total shift of gears. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited for something totally different. I'm excited to get back to kind of Avengers land, if you will. Mm-hmm. Not that their Avengers will be in it, but just the political right. side of Earth. That'll be really fun. So we got to cover that. And then you and I over on Screensaver and Screensaver Plus, we have massive plans that I'll be announcing fully online this week. But we have plans to cover on Screensaver all the major blockbusters that we're excited about this summer. Uh, And I'm excited to get to those. We have a few things lined up already for that. But then on Screensaver Plus, if you're a Tier 2 or Tier 3 subscriber of Friends from Work Plus, you and I have already recorded a Batman episode from the 1989 Michael Keaton uh, uh, movie, and then a Snyderverse episode. We've been wanting to do a DC episode, mm-hmm. and that's over there on Friends from Work Plus, Tier 2 and Tier 3, and oh my gosh, it was about as fun as as we've ever had. I watched seven hours of Zack Snyder over a weekend and yeah. then vented about it on the podcast. So, so much coming up. We're so thankful for all of you guys. Hope you enjoyed Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. What are your thoughts? Hit us up on social media, on our website, the FFWpodcast.com, and that's where you can go to find our official rankings, and you can go to our Journey Through the MCU podcast playlist to hear some of the music from that film. We'll be updating that soon, and uh, we'd love to hear from you guys. Stay in touch. Join our Discord. Buy all this merch. Buy this shirt. Buy nerdriot.shop, promo code friends from work, and then we'll see you next time here on Friends of the Wonder.